Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Brass Junkies. I'm your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by the technical brainstorming crack solution team member, Lance the Duke. Lance, how are you? I'm not doing crack anymore. <laughs> we, we just spent like 10 minutes trying to get his internet better, and it uh, is the same. Yeah, it is the same. <laughs> After extensive work, I have managed to keep it exactly the same. <laughs> hey, Lance, guess what, what are you doing on October 9th and 10th? I'm busy. Are you, <laughs> well, that's a problem because we are hosting an event called the Brass Career Intensive, which is presented oh. by both the Brass Junkies and the Entrepreneurial Musician, my other podcast. You can find them both at pedalotemedia.com. You can learn all about this at BrassCareerIntensive.com, but it's October 9th and 10th, and Lance and I are each doing a whole bunch of classes on a wide range of topics. We are also joined by uh, Mary Bowden of uh, Serif Brass and also by some guy named Jeff Connor uh, from Boston Brass. We're going to talk about about forming and running a world-class uh, brass quintet. Mary's obviously talking about that. I'm just kidding, Jeff. I'm just kidding. Um, Mary's going to talk this. all about uh, all about crafting um, an online presence. Um, she, the reason why she has such a huge online presence. Well, there's two reasons. The first one is that she does amazingly awesome stuff creatively, but then she's really good and intentional about how she presents that and how she shares it and where she shares it and et cetera. And she's going to kind of unpack all of that for us. Uh, there is going to be a bonus winning the audition, which is going to be included. Uh, for everyone that registers. Anyway, you can learn all about this uh, uh, at BrassCareerIntensive.com. I also wanted to take a moment to wish you a happy birthday, Lance. Oh, thank you. How about that? This is my favorite week of the year. When we're, when we're recording this, it's, the, it's two days after my wife's birthday. So I have five more days where she is my age. And I just keep asking her if she's like extra sore, like she must feel <laughs> tired. It's got to be rough. And then on Saturday, I will go up by one and she gets 51 weeks of me not being a pain in the butt about that particular thing. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it probably feels like a small victory. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. you probably just, you just reappropriate those energies into <laughs> to be yes, a pain in the ass in some other right. way. <laughs> and you do what uh, you do best. Well, happy birthday, Lance. I, I appreciate it. This is all I got you. So I, I was going to say, I hope that you got me what I got you. Well, no, I got you more than you got me because I told you when we recorded that it was my actual birthday, and I actually remember that it was your birthday. But but anyway. So your gift to let, me was reminding me. Let, let's stop. Oh, I see. Let's all stop right. picking that okay. scab. So uh, tuba players, also look out for an announcement soon about a, a big tuba event that we've got coming this fall. Speaking of tubas, tuba players... I'd like to thank Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker Smooth. Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba. Component means that they're like transformers. You can like mix and match and stuff. It's pretty oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Including the Andrew Hits Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LaDuke Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So we have been getting questions from listeners, and so I have a question. No, oh, you're you don't you've never listened to the show ever. I, you, I, I I actually have a have I listened to the show? I've listened to parts of some of the shows. Have you? Uh huh. I'm trying to think if I have. The only one I, I plan on listening to the Sam one again. I haven't had the. I just haven't been able to get myself there yet. But um, but I don't know if I have other than that. How about that? No. I actually do have a bona fide question. Okay. How's the entrepreneurial position going? Uh, how's it going? Yeah. It's going great. Yeah. So how many episodes are you up to now? Something like... 237, maybe? Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty you good. stick with it, you might get something going here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just got back into a groove because my son is in like actual in-person school again. And so I'm not like the housemaster of an elementary school of one child uh, any longer. So, yes. Well, and this is not apropos of today's episode, but I'm curious. So I'm going to ask you this question now. 
uh, as well. So how has the show changed in the seven years, eight years, nine years, seven, seven years, a year? <laughs> it's like I've released all 237 episodes in a month. It was a very busy month. <laughs> so uh, what's the what's the evolution been like? Well, or what would you say is different than from when you started it? There's, well, quite a bit is different. I mean, I, it, it started as every other week, and then it went to um, every week, but every other, the in-between weeks were like TEM shorts. And then, like, the, the format, the, the, the frequency has been way off the last year and a half, which at first I was fighting, and then I was like, I'm in the middle of a global pandemic, and my son is, you know, it's just like, great, this is what it's, it's going to be, what it's going to be. Um, and, uh, so I've done a lot more solo episodes of late cause it's been more of, um, that was just kind of a practical decision just because, uh, you know, to, to get, uh, an interview, you have to like plan ahead. There's like a lot more that goes into it. And I was just basically like, okay, it's 10 PM on a, on a <laughs> Wednesday night, everybody's asleep. I have an opening. And so I would then just write out an episode, record it and put it all together and then just kind of do it, you know? Um, so yeah, things things have changed. Things have changed quite a bit. I mean, I'm I'm constantly tweaking the format. That's actually one of my favorite things about making content like this, which is that you know we we didn't used to pre-record intros, or now we've lately been doing outros, and we might keep doing that after interviews. We might not. It's just like you know there is no map. You get to draw the map, and there's like no chance that you draw the exact map that you should and sometimes you do draw the right map at the right time but then it turns out that you or the needs of the audience or whatever changes and so that's what i love is like that there is no correct answer um it's just like self-awareness and the one thing that has not changed is that from the very beginning i've just tried to figure out what the audience wants to hear and what they're going to benefit from and then that's what i put in which is why like the vast majority of like requests that I get. And by vast majority, I mean 90 something percent of requests I get from people to join, to, to join me for an interview. Like they don't even mention the TEM audience at all. It's like, they just want to be interviewed because they want to get as much publicity for their book or whatever as possible. And I don't even tend to answer those pitches just because, you know, it's same thing with us choosing who we interview for the Brass Junkies, right? It's like, yes, mm -hmm. it's people that we want to interview, um, but it's also people that we think are, are people are going to dig or that they already dig or that they should know about or, you know, we kind of, we have like a, a matrix, I guess, right? Of like, mm -hmm. you know, if we could have more downloads and we have a lot, we're, we're very lucky, but we could have even more if all we did was interview like super famous mainstream, you know, classical... <laughs> brass players. Um, but that's not what we're looking to do, you know? Yeah. So similar with TEM. So you just kind of get to steer the car wherever you want at any time, which is pretty, it's, which is exciting. There you go. So there you go. See? How about that? Well, that so was go for... listen to his show. Cause you've that... got 200 and yeah. 275,000 episodes yeah. <laughs> to get caught up on that. That first, that first question was from a, a listener, Lance in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So thank mm -hmm. you for that question, Lance. <laughs> First time uh, questioner, um, short time listener. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. So we've, um, if we have time, we have three questions. We'll, we'll see how long winded we get. Um, by we, I mean me. Uh, the first question is from Allison in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, what is the single best practicing tip you've ever received? Start with you, Lance. Um, single best. Boy, that's a good... Uh, you know, the thing that jumps into my head is a thing that I'm sure other of, others of my teachers told me this, but it resonated with Tucker Jolly when I was at the University of Akron. And that was, if you can't sing it, you can't play it. Yeah, and so he had this. It, he was adamant about that, and then to sing it at whatever speed you needed to, but that you like the process to really learn a piece was you would sing it, then you would play it on the piano, like plunk it out, then you would uh, wind pattern it, then you would do it with the finger. It was just like he said, it's incredibly um, feels tedious, but by the end of it, you're just like you know this thing inside and out, cold, mm -hmm. like you just absolutely know it. But if you can't sing it, you can't play it. 
record yourself is the other thing I probably heard most often. But yeah, that, that's uh, that's really good. Yeah, I I'm reminded of the uh, the inside the practice room that I did through Hits Academy recently with uh, Patrick Sheridan, uh, which we will uh, throw a link to that um, in the show notes. Um, the he said that he said most people would be um, would be very surprised at how much ear training he does when he's learning a new piece of music mm. that he spends like uh, an amount of time going through and being able to sing it that he said I don't remember his exact words but the gist of it that most people would probably be shocked at how much time in terms of amount and percentage that he's working up a new piece that he spends singing it makes perfect sense yeah, because how often this happens with students? Oh, it happens with me. It happens with students all the time. Where you play, if you were, if I asked you to play "Happy Birthday" or something that you know inside and out, and you played a wrong note, you would instantly know. But if I asked you to play Terrell Thirty Seven or this excerpt or that part of this solo, and you're, especially if it's, if it has moments where it doesn't do a thing that you think it should, it's a yeah. little less down the middle, mm-hmm. or. <laughs> it happens to be a valve combination that it could be a C or it could be an E flat mm-hmm. and you don't know that tune. Yeah. You could end up on the wrong partial and live there for a long time until that thing sounds right. Mm-hmm. And then you come to your lesson and you're like, well, that's, you're off by a partial. And you're like, ah! yep. yeah. <laughs> I've never had that happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I believe Sam said, you're the first student I've ever had. You've never been on the wrong partial ever. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I might be making that up. The yeah, if you can't sing it, you can't play it, right? I mean, the the instrument just amplifies the thing, and and also it's uh, it's incredible to me the one to one ratio of when a student sings it in an incredibly like monotone and uninteresting manner. I've never had a student sing it that way and then play it really, really musically, you know, or in an exciting manner, right? I have had I have had students sing things poorly because their voices aren't that good. They're not that trained. They're, you know, but but it's like, but it's exciting, right? And then um, I, I'm not talking about like going down low and it being out of tune because you can also tell right away, right? When a student has just run out of low register. And so it's like, it's sharp because it's like, you know, straining them vocally, or it's sharp because they don't hear the right pitch, right? Mm-hmm. Those are two different phenomena. Do 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 do. Phenomena. Do 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 do. <laughs> so stupid. The oh, that's that's great. Uh, and so it's all, and it's always easy to spot the difference, right? And I, I'm always adamant to students, like, no, 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 it's it's cool. I'm not asking you to like. You know, I, I'm not asking you to sound like uh, like Pavarotti here, like we're just um, or Renee Fleming, like we're just trying to. I've also never had a student sing it really excitedly and then play it in a boring way either. There's like always a direct relationship, hesitant, hesitant. You know, mm-hmm. like going for it, going for it. It's like there's, it's it's really really incredible. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's a that's that's a really really important one. Um, so what is it for me? The single best practicing tip I've ever received. Um, I'm the one that curated the questions from the ones who received. So you'd think I would have thought about all this. No, the, I would say it was when I heard Marty Hackleman talking about his routine. So he was talking about, uh, about like warming up, which he doesn't like that term. He, he calls it his daily routine. And he, he says that a byproduct of that is that he is warmed up both mentally and physically. I'll throw spiritually in there just to make it sound even fancier, um, you know, every day. But he used to say that, um, you know, he would say that 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 his goal every day was to make his routine just a little better than it was the day before. And he was quick to point out, you know, because you'd think like, don't you run out of, you know, don't you hit like the ceiling at some point when you're like Marty Hackleman who doesn't play anymore, but when he was at the height of his powers, I mean, my goodness, what came into his head came not just out of his bell, came into my ears, right? I mean, it's like the whole, that's the whole goal. It was like all checks, right? Um, He said that sometimes making it better was simply making it a little bit more efficient than it Mm. was yesterday, just a little bit less physical exertion just a, which is more sustainable over a long career um you know your 
you're already in it. I'm knocking on the door of the age where you just, you can't, you know, your face starts to have opinions if you don't, if you're not efficient about stuff and regular about stuff and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so sometimes it's just making it a little bit more efficient. And that was a real kind of call to action for me, you know, where, where it's like the, the, the desire to improve every day. Pat talked about this in his inside the practice room too, using different words. It was a different specifics, but that you always need something that you're striving to push forward in a specific way to kind of keep the, you know, the carrot, um, you know, in front of you rather than just treading water and people like Mary Bowden, who we mentioned in the brass career intensive or Pat or what, you know, they can all tread water and be fine, right? Like Mary doesn't need to get any better at the trumpet. She's really good at the trumpet. If she were here, there's a bunch because she's really smart. Uh, she could tell us a few things that she really wants to get better about the trumpet. So could Pat, so could, you know, so could anybody. Um, but like, she doesn't need to get any better. Like she's going to get hired to play solos. She's going to like, she can already do all the stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but like, but yeah, that's a, that starts to get to be a, uh, an onerous journey when you're there <laughs> you just kind of like uh, you know that yeah that's not that's not good well staying regular at my age is definitely one of the things i think about the most <laughs> which reminds me of jim nova you know the mary papper <laughs> school of music at duquesne university is a fine institution in all seriousness it is and so they've got some amazing uh, brass faculty and some great ensembles that you can participate in i want to encourage you to Visit the uh, link in the show notes to find out more about the Papert School at Duquesne University. And a very, very special thanks to Jim, um, making the irregular, regular Nova for making that possible. <laughs> for regularly making it possible. Regularly irregular? I guess that would work. <laughs> Andrew, I have a question for you. Uh, do you? I do. Peter from San Luis Obispo, California, has a question. Okay. Do you know Peter? I I don't think so. I don't either. So what is the trait you most look for in a student? Is it height? I was going to guess you were going to say height. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not, not, not height. Uh, well, the first question is, um, is, are they, um, are they a Yankees fan? That's the, that's the, that's the first question. Boy. Uh, all right. Spoiler alert. Guess who we're going to talk to very soon, Lance. Um, <clears throat> Manny Ramirez. Uh, that would be awesome. I happened to be in the ballpark when he hit his 500th home run, which was pretty cool. There you go. Uh, no, uh, Joe Alessi is making his triumphant return to the Brass Junkies. That was my second guess. And we we had him scheduled, and we had him scheduled when the Yankees had won, God, how many games was it in a row? It was like an obnoxious number, and he was like – he was giddy to talk to me when the Yankees were on a uh, on a rampage, and um, and then luckily that something came up and we had to reschedule, and uh, and since they just lost a series to the Baltimore Orioles, who are the worst <laughs> team in baseball, so I'm feeling better about talking to Joe again. So and I was just going to edit the first 15 minutes of the conversation out, and then just like there'd be an interview, and then there'd be a little bloop in the video, and then we would talk about trombone, but um, but now we can keep the baseball talk. So. So what is the trait I look for most in a student? Uh, it's curiosity. That's it, is curiosity. I would, um, I, that's what I look for in a business partner. And by business partner, I mean like starting a company with me, business, par like pro a partner on a project. Like if we're going to just like, hey, let's do an event together. Um, somebody who is cool with like, okay, yeah, we have a good idea. Here's how we want to structure it. But then as more things become clear, like they're cool with like trying a different way, right? Like, you know, and maybe trying it, a change in directions before I want to, or maybe after what it doesn't have to align with everything I think, but just curious about getting the process better curious. Uh, so for a student curious in the practice room, curious about like listening to new, styles of music list curious about listening to music that they've listened to a hundred times but in a different way curious about trying different things in terms of structuring their practice or uh, you know like whatever like curious about trying meditation i mean it, you don't have to be curious about trying meditation but just curious to to learn are the people 
that I look for as friends, as colleagues, as mentors, as students. That's like the single trait that kind of bounds them all together are people who are not completely full sponges. And that goes for every single brass player that we have referenced so far who are all big deals in our corner of the world. You are not a full sponge. You're like always ready to learn something. I, I didn't mean, you're a completely empty sponge. Yeah, it's like, it's like you'd think Very that dry. Some, something would get stuck in there at some point, mm. not today. Uh, but yeah, that, that, so that's it is to, is to be curious because that permeates absolutely every aspect of playing, learning and being. So there. Mic drop. That's pretty good. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm just, I don't know if it's the age thing or what, but I've always been kind of impatient about this. Where I'm going to learn these pieces because I'm supposed to learn these pieces, and I'm going to play this fast because I'm supposed to be able to play this fast. And I'm going to, like, just as brass playing as an athletic event is just so dull to me. Yes. And some of that is that it, some of it is the way we're taught, you know, there's right notes and wrong notes, and here's the repertoire you should know, and here's the stuff that's state of the art of your instrument. You know, this is the, the, the best stuff that there is for your instrument. But at some point, and actually, this this often I've seen I've seen the face of this student in my studio many many times, and it hits them at different periods. Um, not all students, but many students, where they get to a point where they know all the fingers to all the notes, and they can play faster than any of the pieces that they're working on require, and higher than any of the pieces that their music requires. And then they're like, "Well, now what?" Because you you could play any of the repertoire. This is a euphonium specific. And so, it, granted, there's more trumpet repertoire, but at some point, at some point, Jens could play everything. He could play all the repertoire. At this point, he, Mary Bowden, Jose, Taga, like, name your trumpet player. They know all the fingers to all the notes. And so then, the interesting ones to me are the ones who decide to use their powers for good. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and like to be, because we're so often recreators of music. And so anybody who decides, oh, I'm going to create my own blank and do take his, my own spin on. Actually, I just saw that Gould and Dave Taylor's Ewald thing uh, is coming out. And Giving it away. I want to hear it. Cause yeah. it's like they're there. They will have a gr Sure. They're recreating music that was written 140 years ago or whatever it was. But I, my hunch is there's a ton of strong opinions on there mm -hmm. about how that stuff should sound. Yeah. And so that's that's what I would hope. That's what I look for is not just that you can check off the boxes on all the on all the Olympic events in the musical decathlon. Yes. But that you've decided that um, you want to go be an artist and that yep. that requires something else. Well, why do you learn a language? You learn a language so you can communicate with people, right? So it's like, you know, if you if you're like learning Spanish as a second language and then you essentially, I mean, it would take like decades to learn all Spanish words, just like, you know, but, but you could, uh, you could in a lot less than decades learn 99% of all words that would come up in conversations with anybody 99% of the time. And, and so then you go like, okay, now what? It's like, well, why did you learn how to speak Spanish in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like to, to be able to communicate with people who who only speak Spanish, or to be able to communicate with people who primarily speak Spanish, you know, it's like to to communicate. So now go communicate. Yeah. Like, yeah, the the whole like learning another language, or higher, faster, louder, just for the sake of higher, faster, louder. If that's your thing, that's cool. But um, but the question is, what trait do you, do you look for in a student? It's like mm -hmm. that. I'm not the teacher for you if that's your main push. I just because like that that's like that's so far from my worldview which isn't better than yours but it's uh you should find a teacher whose worldview aligns with yours because there are plenty we could all name them for like each of the brass instruments who are really good at teaching the higher faster louder thing yeah you know yeah, and yeah, yeah. and kind of and some whose students you can tell that that's kind of the main thing that they do <laughs> you know right. and then other teachers whose kid you know students end up doing a lot of creative stuff um I, you know 
it's yeah you just got to find the right teacher but also part of the thing for teachers is finding the right students well yeah and that you know the the longer i'm doing this the more selective i'm getting about uh, i just want to get into a military band that's awesome you should want to get into a military band but i'm not the person to help you do that well, Cause let me let me correct you. Have... You are. You're just not the best person to help you because yeah. you you literally did it. You could teach yeah. anybody to do it, but you're not the best because you don't life's have a... too short. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You should yeah. go find somebody who that's like that's that's they're way more passionate about that than I. I'm way more passionate about, and I'm getting better at being very direct with students. That because I tend to be. I know this is you won't believe this, but I tend to be nice. And so I just say nice things and I kind of softball things, but the older I get, I'm not, I'm still nice, but I say we're, we may not be the best fit for you because I want the, you know, this year I have a student who's, um, he's going to do a mashup of actually he'll be listening to this. So now he has to do this. Awesome. Cause I'm going to out him now and he listens to the show. Uh, so he's going to do a mashup of Boney Vare and Mahler for his recital. Cool. And he's figure out how to do the tech, which we, yeah, it's so, it sounds so cool. And then I've got another student who's started a publishing company because the music that he wants, he can't find good editions of, and he's an awesome typesetter and creative, uh, <coughs> cool dude. And so it's like, those are the, those are the folks I have a, a, a an undergrad who's super passionate about, let's say, I want to say this carefully and appropriately she really wants to champion music that wasn't written by dead white dudes and so that's not as easy as it should be and not as easy as it will be and i firmly believe that she will be a part of the solution for making it easier for those who come after her yeah she's she's doing the research to find the repertoire i mean there's there's easier to find stuff and less easy to find stuff and she's gone through the easy to find stuff and now she's digging into the harder to find stuff and so that's just that that's uh, you know I'm not gonna be doing this forever and so I don't need notches in my belt for these are the people who are now playing in military bands not to denigrate that but it's just not I don't that doesn't that's not a good marker for me right and you might never hear of the students that um that have come through my studio, but I I know what they're doing and I know how cool it is and the mark that they're making and maybe some of the opinions that they're changing specific to what the euphonium could or should do. So, ah, uh, eh, uh, <laughs> man, that's, uh, that's such good stuff. Well, and you, you, uh, last thing before we, uh, get to Houghton here, which is that, that there are, if you want to, first of all, if you want to get a degree in euphonium and you want to do all normal recitals, then like, great. There's lots of places that you can do that. If you want to uh, do really creative stuff, some some people heard, you know, that mashup idea for a recital and are rolling their eyes and they're right. And so is your student. Your student's yeah. also right. I right. But, but there are, um, I can't think of a single school where you wouldn't get any pushback for doing something really creative for a recital on some level. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, if you have a teacher who isn't going to really go to bat for you, then that's not the place for you to go. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, it's, uh, and there are some people who used to, I mean, you know, like uh, D David Fetterly uh, talks all the time about his first, first like year with um you know studying with jacobs you know it was like all like I i'm very much paraphrasing right now but it was like all like whole notes you know it was all like first few pages of the arm is just like all producing a beautiful sound and again I'm, it's been a while since i've heard him talk about this so i'm very much paraphrasing but the gist was he was like let's go and mr jacobs was like we're gonna work on this first and you know obviously it turned out really really well i mean you know he's like well, federally in my opinion, is like one of the great artists uh, of my lifetime uh, that who his instrument happened to be tuba. But in terms of brass players, they just like seeing him play with the Baltimore Symphony was like was amazing. And oh, by the way, there were times when I would stop and really appreciate the tuba operating because it was at like a world class level. But that was not the first, second or third headline when listening to him. It was just like it was the art that was happening that happened to be the tuba part, which is like the ultimate compliment from me. Um, 
But so there are some people who used to study with Arnold Jacobs who wanted to like, let's go. And, you know, and Jacobs was like, actually, I need you to play with a slightly better sound on the first page of the Arbenz book. And yeah, some people he was the right teacher for other people. He wasn't. That's true of absolutely everybody. Right. Um, you just got to find the, the right teacher. But um, but definitely don't uh, just, you know, apply to the big names. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Poke around. Look mm -hmm. under the rocks. Um, so um, pick uh, two numbers between 1 and 12. 47 and mm -hmm. 5. Okay. 5, 4, and 7. <laughs> so uh, Houghton, I'll do, I'll do, okay, 4. Houghton Horn stocks the finest makes of brass instruments, including Bach and Kahn Selmer, Eastman and Shires, Engelbert Schmidt, Paxman, Tyne, and Yamaha, among, among many others. <laughs> among. <laughs> Come be among them. Um, number five would be Mouthpieces by Greg Black, Lasky, Pickett, Schilke, and more. Seven would be Repairs and Customizations in-house. 547. Okay, I'll pick one and 12. So Houghton Horns aims to spread the joy of music through providing the highest level of product services and resources to the brass playing community. And guess what, Andrew? What? If you enter the promo code JUNKIES at online checkout, you'll receive 10% off your purchase from Houghton Horns. Get out of here. Some limitation supply. Very special thanks to Houghton Horns for being our sponsor. Look at you. Look at them. that. Look mm -hmm. at us. Look at it all. Okay. Last question here is uh, from uh, Mary in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, I don't think this is Mary Bowden. Maybe she was just passing through Bentonville. Bentonville. Is um, that where Wal Walmart's from? Uh, yes, it is where the headquarters is. Okay. Yep. Maybe. Uh, I'm in a creative rut. How can I get out of my comfort zone? <sighs> Shovel aisle four. <laughs> the well, your your answer to the earlier question is a good one. Curiosity is a good one. Sometimes it can be a creative rut. So, I mean, I guess it depends on why you're in a creative rut. Is it because you're not what What is there to get curious about? I'm in a creative rut because of the pieces that I'm playing. If that's the case, find different pieces from repertoire that you're not familiar with. Um, if it's a creative rut where your physical limitations are holding you back, we'll work on the physical limitations and that might solve the creative aspect of it. If you're just like sick of the books that you have and sick of the music that you have, cre create music of your own, like write something right. or go, what is everybody doing? What are all of your peers doing? Go in the exact opposite direction. If all of your peers are focusing on the faster, higher, louder thing, do the equivalent of the Pat Metheny for your instrument, which is carefully thought out and well-planned notes of longer duration. Not that Pat Metheny can't shred, but if I want to hear really thoughtful, long melodies with not like 16 to 30 seconds, Pat Metheny is my first go-to. So just emulate... Well, I guess another thing you do is like, if, what would it feel like if I wasn't in a rut and then create that or combine things that are ridiculous. I'm going to write a piece. So, um, uh, Dos Amigos, uh, or, and, or the big bottom band often they uh, m frequently exclusively frequently, let's just say they would just agree on a, a groove and then one of them would just, usually Sam would just say some ridiculous name. We're now going to play Space Viking Mambo. <laughs> the, Dos Amigos was Sam Palafian and Pat Sheridan's uh, tuba duo with uh, with percussion. For anybody so you just, just start with, the th come up with a ridiculous title for a thing and then bring it into life. Mm -hmm. It's a funny thing. Like, I don't... <laughs> Maybe other people would argue, but I don't feel like I've ever been in a creative rut. Like, I don't know. It's like, uh, hmm. was Seth Godin recently had a thing about uh, writer's block and that there's, you know, there's like writer's block doesn't really exist. You're just afraid of bad writing. So just write. And then you go get all of that out. So just write. And then the stuff that's not good. Oh, actually, I had a student talking to me about this, said Frank to Kelly was talking about composing. 
So this is twice removed. But so Frank Kelly's written a bunch of really awesome band music. We've met him a number of times through the American Band College and Wibbick. Uh, Western International Band Conference. And uh, Frank talks about the fact that when you're writing, you don't have to know, you don't have to know all of it. You just like, you write the stuff, this, I know this part's good and I know I need to get to this part. So just write any kind of garbage to get you to that other part. And then you work on that part and then you just keep doing that to the end. And then you work on the garbage part to make the garbage part not garbage and connect these two ideas. But we often just get so slowed down by thinking that everything has to be perfect Writing is rewriting. Writing is editing. Like you just do a brain dump and get everything out of your head and then go back in and decide what's in there. So I don't know if that's what's intended by the notion of creative rut. But just do the opposite of what you've been doing. Yeah, that, that's, that's great advice. Well, Seth Godin, as you just mentioned, he calls it tension, which tension is when you don't know whether something is going to go well or not. And um, this recording this with you today, uh, I, of course, I care whether it goes well, but we have spoken with each other so many times and we have a list of good questions. Like, there's no chance that this isn't going to go well, right? I mean, there are some people who think that every episode of this podcast is complete and utter garbage. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, like, it's, the, you know, there's no chance that you and I were going to just get on here and, like, clam up, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. we're just talking into our mics and we're going to share it with the world and there'll be a bunch of people who like it. There'll be a bunch of people who don't like it. And there'll be some of each of those groups that will talk about their opinion. And like, and then we just make episode 173. Yep. Um, there's no tension. here. The first time that we did an interview, there was tension. Cause it's like, how do you, how do you start? How do you, how do you end? Like, how do you right? I mean, you just like, how do we, what, what do we call it? Like, you know, and now it's like, and that's going to do it for another episode of the, I mean, that's like it all, that didn't, it's not like we spent like, you know, a week in a retreat to figure out like, okay, this is how we're going to get out of every interview and this will be the inflection. And it's going to be, we didn't even beforehand decide that I was the one that would start the episodes and, and that just kind of, it makes sense for one of us to do it and not mm -hmm. for the other to do it and to not have to decide like, are you, it's like, it's just me. <laughs> and then I ask right. you a ridiculous question and you say something funny and then like, and then we're off and running. Um, but none of that was decided until it was decided. You can hear the evolution of it yourself. Like, you know, like by listening to the earliest episodes. So, um, the it was uh the the writer uh w somerset Mogham um had one of my favorite quotes which was i just talked about this on the the tem that is actually just came out last week as you're hearing this um that um he said uh i only write when i am inspired and then he said luckily i'm inspired at 9 a.m sharp every morning which just like he had a system where at 9 he was sitting at his desk writing <laughs> like this was like what and he wrote a lot like and mm. he just you know so um a very famous uh you know playwright and novelist and short story is that how you writer. pronounce that i don't know is it not w i think it's oh. w <laughs> i've uh, I, I could very well be i'd send your emails to uh, uh, parker parker yeah That's right. The, but but so I, I have had, um, again, just talked about this with um, with John Bassesi, who's a, a percussionist in the President's Own Marine Band, who has like written a children's book and has uh, published arrangements and an original composition and has helped start a nonprofit. And like he's he's very entrepreneurial in spite of having like a, a big day gig. Um, but we, we you know, we talked about that, that Mogham, um, uh, you know, quote, which is just like. That I have had a lot of success in life changing my thinking through acting differently. And mm -hmm. I've had very little success changing my actions through simply thinking about things differently. <laughs> Yeah, it's like yeah, it's it's much easier for me to like to keep my feet moving, and then my brain, whether it's my attitude or my fears that go away or my confidence that comes back usually goes by just like doing something enough um, rather than just sitting there thinking really hard about like, okay, how can I have this first episode of this podcast I'm about to launch be less embarrassing? <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. you just gotta like, 
we had quite a start to our podcast, you know, and so we just kind of like we figured a lot of things out, you know, by you yeah. got to so you got to do it by doing. So just, you know, figure out figure out what you're scared of and lean into it. Mhm. Uh, I'm reminded of flow as well where the cha- the your abilities and the task at hand need to be aligned. So if you're in a rut, you're yes. probably not you it, not probably. You may not be trying hard enough or being uh, critical enough or taking enough risks or um choosing your inputs differently uh, mm-hmm. and you know like who inspires you like pick a complete monster on there go listen to victor wooten or go listen to chris thiele or go listen to uh, somebody just do something amazing on some instrument and then apply something that you heard there to what you're doing mm-hmm. yeah. yeah it can even be the vibe that they're putting out i mm-hmm. mean uh, yeah you can yes you can listen to um to i don't know jimmy page you know in like on led zeppelin 3 and you can apply that to playing standard euphonium rep i mean you know it's just like the exclamation points the going for it the there are some spots in zeppelin recordings where it's not quote unquote perfect there's like i mean that band was like you get that drummer and that bass player. And, um, I, you know, I saw somebody talk about how John Paul Jones was one of the luckiest people in history because of who he got to play with. And I laughed so hard that I almost like threw my back out because he's like just a, maybe the most brilliant musician in the whole damn band. But anyway, you have that kind of a rhythm section to a rock band. And it's like it's it's unbelievable how tight they were. But there's a few spots in the studio where like the, you know, the hits of like a downbeat are not exactly aligned um like who cares i mean you know it's like the because it's like it's fresh it's just like i mean it's going for it it's very raw it's um and it's the exception to the rule i mean i'm sure there were takes when they would you know like like any other band would would stop but the point is that like being perfect isn't really the isn't the goal and if somebody has enough money any brass player who's like who's good can make a perfect record if they Mm -hmm. have enough money If you got enough time to have enough takes and then you edit it well enough, you can make like, uh, you know, you can, you can sound like Nikaryakov if you like, (laughs) if you just do it in like super small chunks, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. and then you piece it all together and then you try and do that in a recital and people go like, oh, okay. But (laughs) I, you know, that, that's why also why the, to, to loop it back again, the higher, faster, louder thing should not be the only, there's a guy on the flugelhorn and trumpet he can do all of the faster, higher, louder to the point less laughable, like beyond what most even professionals can do. But then, but the reason that I'm in awe of him is what he does with it. Mm -hmm. Then it's like the things he chooses to play and then how he plays them is like what leaves me muttering to myself, not just the fact that he can circular breathe that well, which is really impressive, but like, uh, okay. I mean, that's kind of like, I'm not going to be impressed with that for too long. I'm going to mm-hmm. go like, wow, that's like shockingly even in terms of like the volume is not budging like a decibel when he's circular breathing even five minutes in. It's like, okay, like that's that's not anything I'm going to be like, Lance, you have to hear this. Why? Because the circular breathing is amazingly even. <laughs> it's like, who cares? Like what? You know, uh, if you were working on circular breathing, then great, you know, especially if you're a student and you show, you know, but but then it's like check out what this dude does mm-hmm. right you know you know there's like limitations to our instruments apparently not you know and then send <laughs> where like, were we what, weren't we standing off stage somewhere listening to him <laughs> itg and, was conducting itg and banff and was sean jones back there with us too maybe uh-huh i dropped yep. a few names there sorry yes you did <laughs> but i'll just that was one of those musical moments I'll never forget yep yeah, that was uh, that was, and that was the first place that we um, heard and saw Minozel as well. Oh yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yep, <laughs> that's a hoot nanny man. Yeah, that Ooh. was uh, that was that was, a, that was a whole sack of nick nick is what that, that was. was. <laughs> that was that was quite fun. Was that the last ITG that we were at? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Maybe uh, <laughs> I'm gonna just choose to believe that was a coincidence and had nothing to do with our behavior. But uh, that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I don't see why you wouldn't. Uh, Allison, uh, Peter, Mary, thank you very much um, for the questions. Uh, you can always reach us through the Pedal Note Media website. Um, you can um, 
you can reach us at uh, pedalomid pedalomedia gmail.com um, especially if you are a, a pr professional who would like to pitch a client for either tem or tbj um that has basically nothing to do with either of our podcasts please email us at pedalomedia at gmail.com we always love to get those um, and the PR professionals especially who email and then email back like at 9.30 a.m. the next day when they haven't received a, uh, a reply for their copy and pasted uh, message where they at least said like, dear podcast host. So that's my favorite when they won't even like go with like dear, dear Lance or, you know, dear Andrew is just like, dear host. Like, yeah, I am a big fan of your podcast because they just don't even want to run the risk of like forgetting to swap out blah 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 business you know like hanged with the entrepreneur musician it's like it's like next level lazy so yeah it's, it's good <laughs> stuff so all right lance this has been fun um, it has been well i hope you have and at this point had a wonderful birthday but i hope so too how old are you going to be in i five will days? be i'll be outing my wife's age now too but i will be 54 wow yeah there you go man born in 1967 that was like a whole other millennium that was uh wow so you were born in the middle of the uh, red sox impossible dream run mm-hmm. yeah that's that's really what i associated with you stress <laughs> <laughs> check out uh yeah check out Yastrzemski's uh yeah 67 season that's uh one of the best ever by anybody. here's this is this is apropos of nothing except that this the only other person that was as excited by this was the host that I'm going to tell you about. So there's a show on NBC called Making It. Okay. I'm not saying, like, there's a bunch of shows that I like that I would not say you should watch this show. I'm not saying you should watch this show. Like, I love Holy Moly. I love Masked Singer. I don't wish to, in, to inflict it on anybody. I just find them fascinating for whatever reason. This show, Making It, is the same way. It's uh, competitive crafting. I'll let that sink in for just a minute. I didn't and know where this was going, but I definitely didn't think it was it's, going with competitive crafting. Okay, so I lost you, but now I'll get you back a little bit. With um, It's hosted by Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman. Because okay. Nick Offerman, I don't know if you know, is like an incredibly talented woodworker. Like He's, in, he's like... For reals, got amazing skills. There you go. And those two with their improv chops, they're hilarious. And then they just give these different tasks to these to these uh, contestants. So the guy who won the whole thing this year, his last name was Kingman. And he started talking uh, to Nick off where they were like, where are you from? Blah, 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 blah. And well, my dad was a professional baseball player. And he was like... Dave Kingman? Fr- Dave Kingman was your dad. King Kong King... And like... I was like freaking out and Nick Offerman were freaking out. And my wife was looking at me like, what is ha- like, are you having a stroke? And Amy Poehler was looking at Nick Offerman with the same bewildered look. And then Dave Kingman was on the last episode. They brought the families out and it was just like this flashback from my childhood. Like we would all like the Sandlot thing. Like, the, you know, if you really clocked one, it was like, Oh, that was my Dave Kingman shot. And it was just like, <laughs> I haven't thought about Dave Kingman since 19, probably 80 or 79. And just this like weird meaning of, I, I, I just did not see that coming. So King Kong Kingman, that was pretty cool. And then his kid won the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. He had 48 home runs in 1979. How about that? Oh, I was like the thick of being into watching baseball and collecting baseball cards and all that stuff. I think the Russell brothers were both probably playing at that point, and it's like, gosh, yeah, they were not good, but he was <laughs> fond memories. There you good go, stuff. Well, good there stuff. You go. Well, we're gonna. Uh, I don't know when exactly it's gonna be. We're, we need to. I actually need to reach out to him today to schedule Joe Alessi. So, if the um, if the Yankees go on another like huge uh, winning streak, I might have to reschedule again. <laughs> we'll see. So, all right, Lance. You're, um, you are, you're an so empty you. sponge. I am. I am that. I am that. And that's, that's going to do it for another episode of The Brass Junkies.
You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Le- Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.